Let's pray. God, you are the God of eternity past, the God of the present, and a God of eternity future. Thank you for condescending to bring Jesus, because he is all and in all and is everything that we do need. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together around your word this morning. I pray that uh, you would speak, that your words would be clear, that you would be put on display, that you would be magnified as the God that you are, that you would be worshiped and adored. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so when his pager went off during a council meeting in Knoxville, Tennessee, so a pager was uh, pre-cell phone technology. <laughs> you could call it and leave a number then you would see it and then you'd go call that number, usually find a payphone or something like that. A payphone. <laughs> All right, so when, it, when his pager went off during a council meeting, Knoxville, Tennessee Police Chief Phil Keith was, was started, startled to see that, that the call was from his mother. Concerned, he rushed to the press table phone and phoned her. Phil Keith, are you chewing gum? Asked his mom, who was watching the council meeting on cable television. Cable television. Yes, ma'am. Well, it looks awful. Spit it out. Keith dutifully removed his gum and went back to the meeting. So we laugh because we're familiar with this type of situation, with obeying mom, right? And you still do it even when you're, when you're old. And, uh, and today what we're going to be looking at is obedience, but obedience to a much higher power. So if you would open in your Bibles to the epistle of John, John's first epistle. So 1 John chapter 2, verses 3. Through 17. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 17. That's what we're going to be looking at this morning. For those of you who are lovers of outlines, we have one this morning. So, first, we're going to be looking at verses 3 through 6. Your heading for that will be We need to kneel in obedience to Christ. Kneel in obedience to Christ. That's heading 1 verses 3 through 6. Heading 2 will be a need to love, need to love, verses 7 through 11. And then we will need to observe, or we will be observing spiritual growth. This will be verses 12 through 14. And then our last section, verses 15 to 17, we will be without worldly affection, verses 15 through 17, without worldly affection. So first we're going to be looking at kneeling in obedience. Kneeling in obedience. 1 John chapter 2 verses 3 through 6. But by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So, we're talking about obedience and what weighs in the balance is whether or not you know Christ. Or at least that's the way most people think of it. It doesn't say that, though. It says, by this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Obedience is tied to this, but what really is the question is whether or not you know God. 
Because a lot of people will come to this verse and start squirming and say, obedience, well, I don't obey perfectly, and am I okay? But obedience is the fallout of what the main point of this is, and that is knowing God. So the question really is, do I know God? And, and so John states, by this we know, gnosko, this is used frequently, the Gnostics, it's one of the kind of the heresies of the time. Gnosko, he's going to use this word know a lot, and he's going to talk about knowing. First, he says, by this we know. Okay, our knowing, so it's a present active. We're knowing, we know now, and we continue to know this. By this we know that we have come to know. So this is pointing to something in the past. This is a, 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 a past tense. So did I come to know him? So can I know now that I have come to know him? And John says, yes, you can. And he ties it to your life. And the reason why he's tying it to your life is because Christ, when he comes into a life, doesn't leave you the way that you are. He changes us. And he changes us to be conformed into his image. And one of the ways he does that is obedience to him. Obedience to him. And so he says... It's the one and, and does not, uh, excuse me, if we keep his commandments, if we are keeping, present active, his commandments, we know. If, we're, if we are practic practically outworking, keeping his commandments, and this isn't numos, this isn't law, this is commands. And we could go back and say, okay, well, so, so what are the commands and which ones do I need to keep? Which ones apply? And I think you're asking the wrong question. Because the heartbeat behind this is obedience to God, obedience to God, obedience to God. And he's going to flesh out more of what he's talking about in our next section. So for now, lock in on the fact that a life lived in obedience to Christ is assurance that I have come to know, and I know that I have come to know God. Because what he produces in a life is obedience, obedience to him. Now, verse 4 says, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So we have, we have this, this thought's going to be repeated over and over again. We're going to have kind of the antithesis of the person that's being promoted, the opposite. And you'll find every single time that this antithesis, this person says, but does not do. So they say, I've come to know God. I know God. And yet, what are they doing? Their actions speak louder than their words. They don't. They don't obey Him. This is consistent disobedience to the commands of Scripture. And this person is called a liar. In John 8, 44, and we'll, we'll kind of frequent John because after all, John did write this epistle. And so it ties very much into his gospel. So in John 8, 44, we read this. You, and Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies. This is the exact same word. And do you see the similarity in thought, right? He's a liar. And the truth isn't in him. What do we have here in verse 4? The person who does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. There's a parallel here. So I thought we were talking about 
that God was in him. Well, who's the truth? I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. No one comes to the Father but through me. He is the truth. So it's speaking, again, of, of God, of Christ and his nature being in us, and it's, it's not in this person's life. How do I know? No obedience. And what we're talking, again, about is a present active. It's a continuing in disobedience. Continuing in disobedience. So... Verse 5, but whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So, verse 5 says, whoever keeps his word. So, it, it's, it's not, this person isn't claiming and isn't saying, instead they're living opposite what we saw of the other person said i i've come to know him good but your life doesn't reflect it and that's not christ-like because christ is not content to leave you where you're at so instead what is he keeping i thought we were talking about commands it says he's keeping his word logos well, isn't that different? No. Aren't these the same? God's word is God's command. It's his God, God's revealed will to us is in his word. He wants to keep his word. Keep his word. And it says that person, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. Wait, I thought we were talking about obedience. We are talking about obedience. And he's just adding a little bit more each time to give us a taste of where he's going because he's going to take us all the way there in the next section. But he's saying God's love is perfected in the life of someone who is loving him by obeying him. They go hand in hand. You can't say I love God and disobey him. Similarly, I can't disobey God and say I love him. It, they go hand in hand. You have to. It's both. If I love him, I'll obey him. Well, I know there are those of you who might be struggling. I don't do this perfectly. Or you're hung up on commands. And what I, where I want to take us is to John, again, Gospel of John, chapter 21. And you'll find this a familiar section. This is... Jesus talking with Peter. And I want us to lock in on what he does say, what Christ does say, and what Christ doesn't say. John 21, verses 15 through 17. So when they had finished breakfast, it's the context, Jesus resurrected called them in, they caught fish, called them in, they had breakfast, he prepared breakfast for them. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. So what did Jesus say and what did Jesus not say? Did he say, Peter, have you been keeping my commandments? Peter, are you keeping my commandments? Peter, are you keeping my commandments? No, what he said was, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Because that which you love controls you, 
you conform to it. And so, was Peter perfect? Did Peter do it all right? Why was Jesus doing this three times? What did Peter do three times? He denied him three times. I'm sure that came to his, his mind thrice, three times. Three times he denied him. Three times he asked, do you love me? Three times. And he says, yes, Lord, I love you. No, Peter wasn't perfect. And no, you and I aren't perfect. But remember this. This is talking about the heartbeat of obedience. This is the difference between um, a person being in the military and the sergeant saying, make your bed. What is expected? Rigid perfection, flawlessness. That that bed should be made, a quarter should bounce off of that, should be absolutely perfect. All right, for those of you who are parents, if you tell your four-year-old, go make your bed. Yes, mom. Yes, dad. I'll go make my bed. Now, when you go into that room and you see that made bed, could you bounce a quarter off of it? <laughs> it's not perfect. It's not. But what's the heart of that four-year-old child? To obey. To the best of their obil- ability to do, to obey. The absolute stringent, strict perfection was accomplished in Christ, in his life. He was absolutely, completely, and totally perfect. It's a good thing, too, because if it depended upon us and our lives, if our standing before God depended upon that, we'd be in big, big trouble. But instead, as his child, there's a lot of grace, and you and I are that four-year-old child trying to do our best with those sheets and make that bed as best we can. And the father says, good job, good job. Now, if you're not showing your children that kind of grace, please come talk to me. If you want that quarter to bounce for that four-year-old kid, it might be a reaching a little high. So here's the heartbeat, getting back to our text in 1 John. Here's the heartbeat behind it. Do I want to, desire to, obey God? Is that my heartbeat? Is that what I want? Are you looking at it from that perspective? This is what I desire. Or or are you stepping into this text and saying, where is the way out? What's the exception? You're looking at it wrong, and I would suggest to you, you need to look at your heart really closely. Verse 6 uh, by this, so kind of backing up to five, by this we know we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner that he walked. Well, in what manner did Christ walk? In what manner do you think is implied? You can look at John 4, 34, John 5, 30, and we're going to turn in our Bibles to John 6, 38, because there's a common thread here. John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. What is it to walk as Jesus walked? To do the will of God. Gee, I don't know what the will of God is. Then you haven't opened your Bible. God's revealed will is in his holy word. That's that's the connection, the loop back to the original thought here in 1 John. So we need to take obedience to God and his word seriously. Here's kind of a very sobering poem. It says, uh, you call me master and obey me not. You call me light and see me not. You call me way and walk not. You call me life 
and desire me not. You call me wise and follow me not. You call me fair and love me not. You call me rich and ask me not. You call me eternal and seek me not. You call me gracious and trust me not. You call me noble and serve me not. You call me mighty and honor me not. You call me just and fear me not. If I condemn you, blame me not. It's a sobering reminder that we shouldn't take this scripture lightly. We shouldn't ignore it. We shouldn't blow past it and say, obedience, pish posh, I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. If you're truly in Christ, you are covered by the blood of Jesus. But you will also take this obedience soberly and sincerely, not dismiss it. This is here is God's word to remind us that a person who knows Christ lives a life of obedience to him. What's your heartbeat? Is your heartbeat to obey Jesus Christ? I hope that it is. Our next section is verses 7 through 11. So we looked at kneeling in obedience. Now we're going to look at our need to love. Moving from kneeling in obedience to our need to love. Verses 7 through 11. Let's read. Beloved, I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which, which, which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you've heard. On the other hand, I'm writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he's in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. And the one who loves his brother abides in the light. and There is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So, approaching this might be a bit confusing, right? I'm not writing you, I am writing you. Old, new, what are we talking about? Well, we've, we get a context. And that context or the thrust of the passage is he's talking about loving your brother. So that's what he's getting at. So, so if I back that up to verse 7 and say old commandment, and this old commandment is something that they've had from the beginning. From the beginning of the written word would take us all the way back to the Pentateuch and would take us to Leviticus 19.18, where we read, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's been there since the beginning. The Jewish people knew it. This was there. This is the old commandment. Okay? So that makes sense. But then we, we step into verse 8. And he says, well, on the other hand, I am writing a new commandment. And so this is where uh, the Greek word kainos helps us. Kainos is the word for new. And kainos can mean new in kind or new in quality. New in kind or new in quality. Let me illustrate for you. Back before the uh, turn of the century, last century, before the turn of the century, before 1900, a man named Henry Ford made something new. That was the automobile, right? It was brand new. That's new in kind. Now, today they say there's the new 2019 Ford Mustang. Well, is it new in kind? It's an automobile. Okay, we've had those. However, is it new in quality? Would you rather ride in a Model T or a 2019 Ford Mustang? 
I, I know the answer that most men in this room would give. <laughs> it's new in quality. So in verse 7, he's saying, I'm not giving you a kainos, new in kind command. Because you have a command that's been there since the very beginning. And that is to love your neighbor as yourself. And like it uh, in Deuteronomy, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But we do have in verse 8 a new in quality command. Let's look at John 15, 12. John 15, 12. Because this is something that Christ said himself to his disciples. And we get the same thing. Same type of statement. John 15, 12. This is my commandment. This is my commandment. That you love one another. Well, that sounds a lot like Leviticus. But he goes further. What's that next thought? Just as I have loved you. So he takes it further. He takes it from just, hey, we should love one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the Pharisees abused that. They manipulated that. And Jesus said, I want you to think of this in, a, in another way. Love one another the way I love you. Well, that's a high standard. And here's the thing. That had meaning then, before the cross. What kind of meaning did it take on to people like Peter, like John, like James? After the cross. When he had died, when he had rose, risen again from the dead, and he came to them and restored Peter and showed his love for John. So this commandment then, love one another as I loved you, now even takes on a much deeper meaning, and it should to the people of God. So when, it, when in verse 8, 1 John 2, 8, when he says, on the other hand, I'm writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, he's giving us another quality. This love is true and made manifest in the life of Christ, not only in his life, but in his death, in his resurrection, in his ascension. So it took on a whole other quality. And then the other aspect that's, that's new is he says it's in you. It's in you. And that's, that's the cool thing in the big difference between the, the, that Old Testament believer and that New Testament believer. There was, there was a thought of with the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. But the New Testament believer, the, the thought is in. The Spirit of God resides in the believer. And so this love is true in us, in us. So John is saying, I do give you a new command, a new command to you, which is true in him and in you. And why? Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. And I know it's been a whole week since you've heard Greg, but this points all the way back to verses 5 through 7 of the exact same epistle. This is the message we have heard from, the, from him, Christ, and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness. If we say that we have fellowship, or isn't that what we're talking about, with him, and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus, his son, cleanses us from sin. This is the light. So the darkness is passing away and the light, the light is already shining. It's not going to. It is. Christ is here and now and present in his people. So with those thoughts in mind, that's, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about the command to love. Then we step into verse 9. And it's going to make a lot of sense now. Verse 9 says, the one who says he is in the light. Okay, again, he says, 
I am in the light. This is the same argument, right? I have come to know him. I have fellowship with him. I'm in the light. I abide in him. These, these are all the exact same thoughts. It's just a different way of saying it, okay? I'm in the light, and yet, and yet, we already talked about obedience to commands, and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. And what did we see in verses 5 through 7? We saw a contrast between light and darkness. And you're in one or the other. There is no middle ground. There is no noon. You know, kind of light, kind of dark. No, you're either in the light or in the dark. And he hinges it on, on again, if I think about it, this is a obedience to a command, but he is driving it to something very important. And that is, you have to love. And the hardest people to love are those that we know the best. So who's my brother? Well, who's my neighbor? That sounds familiar. Somebody asked that question. And he got a response. He got a response in a parable. He got a response in a parable, and that parable was the parable of the Good Samaritan. And the answer to who is my neighbor is everybody. So who's my brother should be easier. It's any other fellow believer should be. And here's a person who claims to be in the light and has hatred towards their brother in Christ. Hatred. And it says they're in the dark. They're not in the light. They claim to be in the light, but they are actually in the dark. Get this. Get the image in your head. It's a person standing out in the pitch blackness saying to you in pitch blackness, isn't it bright outside? No. It's pitch black. It's dark. You're in the dark. No. So what is this? And, and my favorite phrase to hear from people when I say, do you love you know, your wife or do you love so-and-so? The, the most common response I get to that is, well, I don't hate them. <laughs> like, what is that? Are you reasoning through opposites? It's this, this is ridiculous. I don't hate them? So, so what you want me to say is, so you love them. I, I don't hate them is not the same as saying I love them. I'm asking you, and Christ confronts us here, do you love them? What's the standard for love? 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 7. Is that what I look like? Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. It doesn't brag. It's not arrogant. And on and on. Is that me? Well, that should be Christ, right? And in Galatians 5, 22 through 25, where does this love come from? The fruit of the Spirit is what? What's the first one on the list? Love. This comes from the Spirit of God. If that is nowhere present... then where's the spirit? That's what it's pushing up against. Then where's the spirit? The spirit of God. So the person in verse 8, he, or, or verse 9, he's the one that is hating. He hates now, and he's continuing to hate his brother. And he claims Christ. On the other hand, we've got verse 10, the one who loves his brother. Does he say he's loving? Or is he loving? See, again, we get this contrast. We get the one who says and doesn't do, and the one who does and doesn't say. Which speaks louder? Which speaks louder to us? Right? Do you, do you, how well does it work, parents, to say, hey, do as I say, not as I do? Yeah, yeah that preaches, right? We've seen that work. That's the same thing here. So... Verse 10 is the one who loves his brother, abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling. 
He's abiding. He's living. He's, he's conforming. He's becoming like, right? The people you hang out with the most are the people you're going to become like. And if you're spending, this is a person that's abiding, living, sustaining, breathing. My very life is Jesus Christ. And that very life of Jesus Christ, that heartbeat of life, produces that heartbeat of love. I love, I love, I love, I love. And if you don't, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't, you didn't get 1 John 2, 1 and 2, 2. Little children, I'm writing these things that you may not sin. But if we do sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, not only ours, but also the whole world. Folks, if that doesn't mean anything to you, if that hits you dead, flat, it says something about where your love is. It should hit you. It should hit you hard. It should fill your heart with joy to know in Christ I'm forgiven. Why would I not love this Jesus who gave himself for me, a sinner who didn't deserve it, who deserves separation, who deserves to be cast out, and yet he died for me, he loved me, he redeemed me, and he calls me his son. And he says, love, love as I have loved. And by the way, I'm going to give you that heart of love. That's our verse 10 person. Verse 11 fleshes out more of the verse 9 person. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness. We've heard this. We've read this. But he's tacks on to it. And walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So here's the thing. If you're here at this place of hating your brother, it says you reside in the darkness. That's where you live. And by the way, that's how you act. That's what you act out from. That's what you abide in. And you got blinders on. So odds are you don't even see it. And you don't want to hear it. This is sobering. This is some sobering stuff. But this is from the heart of a man who calls his flock beloved. I love you. So I'm going to tell you the hard stuff. I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. It might not be what you want to hear, but you need to hear it. I love you. You need to hear, if you're a hater, that's not God. How can you claim fellowship with him if you're a hater? If that's what marks you. In John 8, 12, Christ spoke of this darkness. 8, 12, then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. So here's my appeal to you. If you are in the darkness, if you see this morning you are in the dark, the answer is Jesus Christ. He's the light. And he'll shine out of the darkness. And he, can, he turns the darkness into light. He will take your life, your broken, messed up life, and restore it and redeem it. It's what he does. It's what he did in my heart, in my life, and many that I know here. So a sobering reminder that we need to love, need to love. So we've looked at kneeling in obedience. We've looked at our need to love. And then our next section is we need to observe 
spiritual growth. Verses 12 through 14, observe spiritual growth. Verses 12 through 14. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. And I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I've written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. So in this section, we actually get three areas or three kind of classes of spiritual growth. And uh, the first few times I, I preached through this, I got lost because uh, if we look at the passage flat here in English, we, we see children and then we see fathers and then we see young, young men and then we see children and then we see fathers and we see young men. And that's kind of a really wacky hierarchy it's kind of a little over all over the map until you look at this in the greek and then it takes on a whole different meaning and also look at what's being said okay in the greek when he says i'm writing to you little children he's talking to his technia technia and we see this in first john 2 1 he says little children we see this in 3 7 little children. We see it in 3.18, little children. 4.4, 4, little children. 5.21, little children. So who's he talking to when he says little children? He's talking to the entire audience. It's every single one of them. And a technia in the Greek was a child from basically from a uh, toddler all the way up to adult. I'm still Rich and Bonnie Thompson's child even though I'm more than something years old. <laughs> I'm still their boy. I'm still their little child. And I always will be. I always will be. And so in verse 12, we're actually, we haven't stepped into the categories of spiritual growth yet. He's talking to all believers. He's talking to the, his entire audience. And, and look what he says. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. Who, who is there that is a believer in Jesus Christ where this statement does not apply to them? Who is there that is in Jesus Christ where this statement does not apply to them? Your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. This is true of every single believer. And there's a reason why he's starting here. Because particularly when, we're, when we start thinking about areas of spiritual growth, commonly we don't think about where we're at. We're thinking about where I should be. Or um, I should be more mature than this. I should be more grown up than this. I'm, I'm a baby and I should be at, at least a teenager by now. I'm a teenager. I should at least be a father by now. And I get all hung up in this and I can get discouraged. But John gently takes us all aside, puts his arm around us, and he says, look, what's true here is that your sins are forgiven. If you're a child, if you're a young man, or if you're a father, your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. So the reminder is that yes, we should be growing in Christ, and we're gonna see this, but is my standing before God determined by my maturity? Or is my standing before God determined by Jesus Christ? That's the reminder. This is true of all of us as believers. And that should be very tender to you. Now what we can do is be honest with ourselves in these next categories to determine where we're at and be honest with ourselves and desire to grow. But don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. That thief on the cross, this statement's true of him. Didn't have a lot of life. He was a baby, 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 baby Christian. 
but this statement's true of him. Little children, I'm writing to you because your sins have been forgiven for his name's sake. For his name's sake. That points back to 1 John 2, 2, by the way. He himself is the propitiation. It's all wrapped up in Christ. Okay, so then we step into, in verses 13 and 14, our, our categories. We get old men, we get young men, so we get fathers, young men, and children. The fathers and the young men are going to be repeated. The children are only going to be spoke to once. And there's, you know, a little bit of here and there as far as why that is. But here's the thing. It's in descending order. We're going to discuss them. We're going to discuss them in ascending order. Okay? We're going to start with the children. So the word for children that he uses in the, in the latter part of verse 13 where he says, I've written to you children, is not technia, it's paideia. And paideia are babies, babies. So he's using this term to speak of a baby. Now, how much does a baby know? Da da, mama. Right? I mean, that's the extent of it. It's not very extensive. There's a dependency. There's a looking to. But it's very basic. And so this is what's true. I've written to you children because you know the Father. Because you know, because you know your dad. You know who your dad is. Now, and that's as far as it goes for those who are baby Christians. This is the minimum. This is what you know. Right? When Christ spoke to his disciples, he said, you want to know how to pray? This is how you pray. What's he start with? Our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. Right? He starts with the basics, the fundamentals. Our Father, who art in heaven. So if you're a baby, if you're a new Christian, God bless you. You know your Father. Because in the rest of this epistle, there's another father, and you're, you're, the, you're the child of one of the fathers. You're either a father, your, your father is either God, or your father is the devil. John's very cut and dry. And so, as a baby Christian, you know, you know God is Father. What you don't know is you're not very mature in the Word of God. And that opens you up to uh, following and, and being fooled by error. But here's your next maturity group. Um, I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. Well, in what way? Well, in the repeat we have, I have written to you uh, young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. And you've overcome the evil one. Meaning, here's a person at a maturity level that knows how to accurately handle the word in such a way that they can refute the lies. We've seen it. Who's the father of lies? Satan himself. They're not going to buy off on the lies. They're battling against the temptations of, of the devil too. And they're battling it with the word of God. That's the next maturity level. And then that final maturity level, this deeper, deeper still, is the fathers. And get the statement here. Because, I'm writing to you fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. And you see, the, that, that phrase just resonates through the Bible. It ripples back to 1 John 1.1. 1, 1 which ripples back to John 1.1 1, 1, that ripples all the way back to Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. And so this is this deeper still. You have known him from the beginning. Is it, is it that this mature person doesn't know the word? No, no in fact... The only way that you really get that deeper 
to know God is, it, is from and in His Word. But here's a person that's pursuing knowing God, not just knowing about God, not just getting their doctrinal ducks in a row and being strong so as to refute lies and error, but a person who truly is abiding and pursuing knowing God. What does this look a lot like? Flip, turn with me to Philippians 3, 7 through 14. Would you say that the Apostle Paul was a mature believer? Would you say that the Apostle Paul was a mature believer? Well, let's look. I would say he was. Look, look though, at at this passage. Look at what he says. Philippians 3, 7 through 14. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them, but rubbish, so that I might gain Christ and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him, that I may know him, Did he know him? Yes. But what was his heartbeat? To know him still more, deeper. That's the heartbeat of the fathers that we're talking about. I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And then look at this. Now, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect. Even a mature believer shouldn't say, I have arrived. It's part of the maturity of a a true believer is a person who says, there's still more to know this God more deeply. Um, But I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but on one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, that I may know him, that I may know him as the heartbeat, power of his resurrection. We're running short on time, so I'm going to clip us along. That's the mature, that's the mature believer. So we've looked at kneeling in obedience. We've looked at needing love. We've looked at observing spiritual growth. And then lastly, verses 15 through 17, you need to be without worldly affection. Without worldly affection. Verses 15 through 17, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. So our first question should be when he's referring to the world, what's he talking about? Um, the The word is cosmos in the Greek, and that can take on several different meanings. Um, to two, it's a people group, uh, whole lost cosmos, whole world. Um, here, it's a system. It's a system of thought. How do I get that, the, that it's a system from the context, right? So that's what really helps me with the word cosmos here to flesh it out. Because he says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but, for, but from the world. So he's not talking about the physical world. He's not, not talking about the people, right? Otherwise, he'd be saying, um, don't love people, not would be totally inconsistent with what he's just got finished saying, right? And he's not talking about don't love the creation because it speaks of him and he created it. So that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the system, the system of thought that says it's all about me. The word lust is, a, is, is the word that we're very familiar with. It's epithemia, over desire. So a person that has this hyper over desire, it fleshly, 
So a desire, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. So this is what the world pushes. And you know what? This philosophy, this system is as old as it gets. If you turn all the way, and we can't, we just don't have time for it, you turn all the way back to Genesis 3, verse 6, you'll see Eve, and you'll see that she says she saw the fruit and that it was good, good to eat, and that it, it's a delight to the eyes, right? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and that it was going to make one wise. Boastful pride of life, right? It's as old as it gets. The enemy is still playing the same record, and it's working. Because we appeal to ourselves selfishly, and that's what it's, this is about. The world system, is, the heartbeat behind it is me, 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 me. I want it, give it to me. And it says, if anyone agapes, agape, the world. So it doesn't say phileo or, or friendship. Uh, you're going to get into that later. This isn't friendship love. This is that deep abiding uh, sacrificial investing value in kind of love. And we're told, uh-uh. There's only one person, first and foremost, that you should love like that. It's God himself. And then you should love others with agape love, but not the world, not the world system, not wanting and desiring the world system. And so he says... He says, the world is passing away, verse 17, the world is passing away, and also its lusts, and the one who does the will of God lives forever. So this is reminiscent of what Christ said. This points us back to either follow me, Christ, follow Christ in obedience, or follow yourself in the world. And the world, the world's going to go away. Right? John, John 3.16, very simply. For God so loved the world, there we go, loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal or everlasting life. So there's your contrast. Eternal life is only found in one place, and that's Jesus Christ. That's Jesus Christ. So I hope what you've seen as a commonality all throughout these sections of Scripture is that the heartbeat of a believer is to know Jesus Christ. To know Him is to love Him. To love Him is to obey Him. And to obey Him proves that I know Him. And if I know Him I, and I love Him, I'm not going to love the world. So we looked at kneeling in obedience, our need to love, observing spiritual growth, and being without worldly affections. So if you have that lined out, you'll see as the first letter, K, the second letter, N, third letter, O, fourth letter, W. So give you an acrostic there in your outline. So the point of these passages is to know God. And knowing him, you will kneel in obedience. We need love. We need to observe spiritual growth. We need to be without the world. K-N-O-W. Know God. So that's our challenge in these, our short time here in this passage. I close with this. There were two sons in the Taylor family in England. The older one set out to make a name for the family and turned his attention toward parliament and prestige. But Hudson Taylor, the younger, chose to give his life to Christ, so he turned his face toward China and obscurity. Hudson Taylor is known and honored on every continent as a faithful missionary of the gospel of Christ and as the founder of the China Inland Mission. But when you look in the encyclopedia to see what the other son has done, you find these words. The brother of Hudson Taylor. So men may have their names inscribed on marble monuments for feats of fame. And someday these monuments will fall in fragments. 
but he that does the will of God abides forever. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, your word is vast and deep. There's so much more that could be said. I pray that your word has just done justice, for you are worthy of all praise and glory and honor. You are great, and you are greatly to be praised. I pray that you are put on display. I pray that the vessel would be forgotten, and the message, the message of your word would be remembered and taken to heart. May we all grow in knowing you, Jesus. For there's no greater thing. Thank you, thank you, thank you for Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.